Hey everybody, how's it going? And welcome to another MAMG Let's Play of 999. When we left off, we actually saw one of the six endings that this game has to offer, and believe me, it did not end very well for any of our characters. But, now I actually have this handy dandy little flowchart here that's gonna give me an idea of where I need to go and what doors I need to access, things like that. So, um, you guys did want to see more um, of Akane or June. Uh, there was also the recommendation or the suggestion to spend more time with Snake, but actually with Snake, you only get that one door because by the time the second thing happens, he's gone. You don't really get to do anything with him. So I think we're done with Snake, at least for that part of it. Um, there are some more things that we can do later on in the game, including investigating the bathroom, which I'm hoping I can do in this video here. But I am actually going to go through uh, door four now instead of door five. Decided that door four would be fine. Okay, yeah, I was like, did I pick the wrong one? He would go through door four with Lotus, Santa, and June. Why Junpei had even considered doing otherwise. He would be there for June, for Akane Kurashiki. It seemed good. He felt it was the right choice to make. He made no shows of affection, but Junpei saw her as something more than just a friend from his childhood. He watched the other four walk toward their door. Ace, Snake, Clover, and Seven. Junpei said nothing as they left. Before long, they had reached door five. They talked to one another. Oh, they had. Okay. Because uh, I wanted to make sure I didn't pick the wrong door. They had talked to one another for a few seconds, saying things Jupe couldn't hear, and then laid hands, uh, their hands one by one on the scanner panel, the red. Ace grabbed the lever, his face tight with determination. He turned over his shoulder to look at Jupe and his companions. Goodbye. Be careful. So we'll actually be able to spend more time with June because we're going to go through the four door. As Ace pulled the lever, the door swung open, the mouth of the great hungry beast. Beyond the door, Junpei knew lay the sad remains of the ninth man. It did not surprise him that Ace, Clover, and Seven hesitated. The body was not a pleasant thing. Snake had no such problems, as his blindness made him immune to the horror. He stepped through the door, his feet making a wet splat in the pool of blood. Do you intend to kill me? I assume you haven't forgotten the door only remains open for nine seconds, have you? Snake had not even bothered to turn around, but the other three steeled themselves and stepped through the door. Where'd they go? At least we know where they're going. Door 5 swung shut, closing, the heavy f uh, closing with the heavy finality of metal upon metal. Junpei and his companions scrambled to the door. They pressed their ears on it, in an attempt to hear what might be taking place on the other side. It's beeping. It's just like before. Probably the sound of the detonator on the bracelet. D do you think they're okay? Jun's face showed her concern more plainly than her words ever could. Almost as though in response to her question, a voice rang out from the other side of the door. It was Seven. Hey, there it is! That's gotta be the dead thing! Come on, get over here! We gotta authenticate! The beeping stopped. The sides of relief were audible even through the heavy door. Phew, looks like it stopped. Junpei and his companions leaned away from the door and breathed a collective sigh of relief on their own. Hey, guys, are you doing alright over there? They heard Seven's voice, but it wouldn't hurt to be sure. Yep, we're fine. Despite the recent danger, Clover's voice was as bubbly as ever. Oh hey, I'm gonna tell you about this whole dead thing, okay? The dead is just like the red, but the color's different. You know how the red was red? Well, the dead is blue. Other than that, it's just like the red. Authenticating is the same too. Awesome, thanks. That helps a lot. Well, we should probably move on now. You be careful out there. Roger that. Junpei and the others left door 5 and headed towards door 4. They stood in front of the red and placed each of their hands upon it. Four asterisks appeared on the screen. Junpei grabbed the lever and turned around. 
You guys ready? Yeah. Sure. Let's go. None of them looked particularly optimistic, but their faces were set. Junpei nodded to them and turned back toward the red. All right, let's go. With strength and determination, he pulled the lever. Run! The four of them leapt through the door together. The moment they had passed through it, each heard a cold, electronic sound coming from their left wrist. In the center of each bracelet, a red skull appeared and began to flash. The detonator's countdown had begun. In the long moment that each of them spent staring at their wrists, the numbered door behind them closed, the sound of metal on metal reverberating down the hallway. There was no way back now. They were committed. If they could not find the device to deactivate their detonators. Hey, where the hell's the dead? How would I know? Don't give me that crap! Start looking! I already am! They began to run, their eyes looking frantically for the device that was the key to their salvation. The hallway they found themselves running down was a long one, easily 300 feet in length. On the right side of it stood a series of wooden doors, all nearly identical. If they had taken the time to think, they would have likely discerned that the doors led to cabins. Don't tell me the dead is in one of these rooms! Oh no! How many rooms do you think there are? Junpei was too frightened to count properly, but his best guess was there were seven or eight of them. There wasn't time to count them to be sure. Junpei ran to the nearest door. He grabbed the knob and shook it, hard. It wouldn't open. It didn't feel locked. More like someone had hammered down an iron plate over the other side of the door. Junpei turned around to find another door and saw that his companions had already run to the doors of their own. They did not seem to be having any more success than he had. Their own words confirmed his fears. Tch, this one's no good. Same here. It's not moving. Jun was the last to speak up. As Junpei looked in her direction, his eye caught something he hadn't noticed before. A small red light. It flashed at him, dimly, from the end of the hallway. That's it! Over there! Even as he yelled, he ran. He grabbed Santa, Lotus, and June and pulled them toward the light. Santa called out to them as they ran. Hey, how many more seconds do we have? How would I know? Our time limit's 81 seconds. I know that! I'm asking you how many seconds we have left. In all likelihood, Junpei figured, nearly a minute had already passed since the door had closed behind them. If that was true... Urgency foremost in all of their minds, they arrived at the end of the hallway. The dead sat on the left wall, blinking almost tauntingly at them. Hurry! Junpei grabbed a hold of the machine, his hands slick with sweat and shaking. <coughs> he slammed his hand against the scanner panel. The other three quickly followed suit. With a grunt, Santa yanked the lever downward. Well, we know where the, they're gonna make it through this, of course. What if they just died right there? It's like, oh, door four, or door four, not five, uh, is the murderous one. Phew, looks like it stopped. His hands beginning to steady, Junpei wiped away some of the sweat that had beaded on his forehead. As they caught their breath, the four companions began to look around. At the end of the hallway lay a heavy-looking set of double doors. Set into the walls of the hallway on either side of the larger door were two smaller ones. They all needed inspecting, but Junpei began with the largest of the three, the double doors. How many times had he come across similar doors with similar results, he wondered. Or perhaps, he corrected himself, more a lack of results. Whatever the reason, the door remained firm and unyielding and refused to allow Junpei, or anyone else, passage. Near the handle was a small keyhole. Above the keyhole was a small symbol, engraved in the brass. Mail? He wasn't quite sure what to make of it, and stared at it for a moment in confusion. It was June that corrected him. No, that's not the symbol for mail. That's probably the symbol of Mars. Well, technically they are the same symbol, but... I saw a number of similar symbols near the main stairway. 
The symbols of the solar system. The sun. Saturn. The Earth. At least, that's what I'm assuming. So, this isn't the man symbol. It's a symbol for Mars? I think so, yes. While Junpei and Jun talked, Santa had disappeared. They turned to find him some distance down the hallway. He had gone to check the other doors. Eventually, he reached the last of them and jogged back. It took him only a moment to catch his breath again. Here's the deal. None of the other doors open. Then that must mean... We only have two more doors. Lotus examined the doors to either side of the large double door. Each one had a metal plate attached to it. Junpei figured there were probably room numbers. The door on the left read B92, and the door on the right proclaimed that it le led to B93. Alright, let's open them. Yeah. Junpei put his hand on the doorknob for the door. It said room 92. Santa moved to the door room 93. They made it through the numbered door alive. There was nothing more to be afraid of. Junpei and Santa looked at each other and nodded. One, two, three. In unison, they pushed against their respective doors and promptly found themselves in a new room. Jun followed Junpei as he threw open his door. They turned around and saw that the door on the other side was open as well. Though the door on the other, uh, through the door was another person, his mouth agape. It was Santa. Hey, uh, it opened. Yeah, it did. Junpei and Santa looked at each other. They had not expected the doors to yield so easily. Lotus's calm voice broke into their thoughts. Maybe this is all part of Zero's plan. I can't say I enjoy being treated like someone's puppet. As she headed for room 93, Lotus continued. Well, now we have these two rooms. I'm sure there's something in there that will help us. Get out of here. Let's find it. Santa and I will search this room. Junpei and Jun, search the other one. Alright. Okay. Oh, more escapey time! Okay. So what's gonna happen here? Whew. I'm not even sure. Alright, so yeah, there's several puzzles that we still need to do, of course. That vase looks suspicious. Or expensive, sure. That vase looks expensive. I wonder how much we can get for it. Are you gonna steal it? <laughs> wow, she didn't even say no. This is kind of weird looking picture. Do you think it's an abstract painting or something? It looks kind of like a demon with an elephant nose. Sucking on a human being's brain. Where the hell did that come from? What's her brain made of? Can't say I'd mind finding out a little bit more about what goes on in there. Her brain is a special one. It's a display case, but there's nothing being displayed. How sad. Looks like the drawer is empty too. Alright, what's this? Matches? It's a box of matches. There are matches inside, obviously. Okay. Junpei looked down blankly at what he was holding, then looked up at Jun. Oh yeah, how's your fever? You feeling better now? Yes, I'm feeling fine. Jun certainly looked fine. Junpei held his hand on her forehead for a few seconds. It seemed her fever really had gone down. Are you worried about me? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> June blushed and giggled. By the way, Jumpy? Hmm? How did you end up here? What do you mean? I told you earlier, didn't I? There was a man with a gas mask when you got home at night. Or no, this is June. Yeah, you inhaled some smoke and passed out. When you woke up, you were on D-Day. Yeah, that's it. But is that really the truth? What? Jumpy. Are you hiding something from me? No! Why would I? Well, if you think about it, this is awfully suspicious. I mean, why would two childhood friends bump into each other in a place like this? Hey, I could ask you the same thing. Are you hiding something? 
What would I hide? Well, I don't know. Anything? I mean, you're hiding it. How would I know? You mean, like, the number of men I've dated? Junpei's heart stumbled over itself. Do you want to know? He had to admit, he was a little curious. Don't worry. She smiled at him. Only 18. Time zero. Yeah, I guess I just haven't met Mr. Wright yet. Jun looked a little embarrassed and scratched the back of her head in a desperate attempt to seem nonchalant. Junpei coughed quietly in much the same way. Anyway, I'm not hiding anything. Just like you, Jumpy. When I woke up, I was on D-Deck. Well, you do have a point. I mean, why did Zero pick us? We haven't seen each other since elementary school. June nodded, and for a few moments, she had the faraway look of someone in deep thought. Look for what connects the victims. That will lead you to the culprit. Do you remember Seven saying something like that? Yeah, I do. So? Well, that's what I'm saying. I think this must all have something to do with the classmate of ours. You got any ideas who it might be? No, nothing. Oh. Well, if it had something to do with school, then it could be one of our teachers, or maybe the principal. Or the janitor, or the lunch lady? No, I can barely remember any of them. Yeah, I know. Junpei went back to searching, uh, to searching feeling unpleasant and confused. Elementary school. Elementary school. Was there anything strange that had happened in elementary school? As he searched the room, he continued to rack his brain. Something strange. Hmm. I wonder. It's a bottle with water in it. This is a bedroom. They probably have it here because your throat always feels dry when you wake up, you know? My throat's dry, but I think that's because I'm a little nervous right now. Well, we did run a lot, so we're kind of sweaty. Hey, Jumpy, do you want to take a shower together? Whoa! <laughs> Just kidding. Too late to take it back. My brain's already working out the picture. Oh, Jumpy. My throat was dry already. This sure isn't helping. Okay, then. The light blue blanket with some designs on it. Someone's made the bed, or at least never unmade it. There's only bed sheets under the blanket, nothing exciting. Ooh, nothing exciting. This isn't a painting. It's a map? It looks like a map of the ship's interior. Oh, this is a great find. I think it'll be really useful. Let's take it with us. It's not possible to use the map screen. Yay. Junpei took one last look at the map, and then folded it up and slid it back into his pocket. Jun looked up as he closed it. The ship's bigger than I thought. Yeah, it's probably about 900 feet long. Must be one of those fancy cruise ships. Of course. <laughs> of course, it doesn't really look like a cruise ship. Everything in here is really retro. Even if it's some sort of style choice, there's just too much. Do you remember what Zero said? On April 14th, 1912, the famous ocean liner Titanic crashed into an iceberg. After remaining afloat for 2 hours and 40 minutes, it sank beneath the waters of the North Atlantic. Why am I yawning? I'm not even tired. Whew. Do you think maybe this boat and the Titanic have something to do with each other? Hmm, that's a good point. I doubt he would have mentioned it if it wasn't a reason. Junpei took a moment to look around the room. Do you think this boat is... Replica? We, we already know it's the sister ship, but hey, whatever. A replica of the Titanic? A replica? Yeah. You know, like a copy of the actual boat. Who on earth would make something like that? Fans? Crazy Titanic fans? No way! Do you even know how much money that would take? No idea. But, all they've got to do is break even, you know? Break even? Yeah. They could use this as a cruise ship. Climb aboard a piece of history, sail around the world in the resurrected Titanic. Hell, with marketing like that, they'd probably have more customers than they'd know what to do with. Do you really think people would want to ride on a ship with such an ominous past? It's the site of the worst accident in history. Over 1,500 people died. 
I wouldn't be surprised if you get cursed just for going. Curse, huh? Jumpy, do you believe in that sort of thing? You know, curses and stuff? Um... Mm, nah. <coughs> Sorry, but I can't really believe in that kind of stuff. Tact was not one of Junpei's better many, many better qualities. But what about you? No, I guess it's kind of a dumb question. Yes, I do believe in curses. In fact, I think it was a curse that sunk the Titanic. What? A curse sank the Titanic. A curse of the Egyptian mummy. Junpei couldn't understand how Jun had managed to, a straight face to say that. Supposedly, the Titanic carried the mummy of the priestess Amun-Ra, which was stolen from a pyramid. And they say that the mummy had a history. Everyone involved with it died mysterious deaths. Come on, I'm sure you've heard of it before. Those who open the coffin will be forever cursed. Haven't you heard that one? So you're saying the Titanic sank because of that curse. That's right. June's eyes lit up with excitement, like a child with a new toy. <laughs> Stupid. I don't buy it. It's true. How can you be so sure? That mummy just wasn't a normal mummy. It was really mysterious. Totally unbelievable. What is so unbelievable about it? Well, supposedly, she was really pretty. Pretty? Yes. But she was a mummy. That's right. She wasn't all shriveled up or rotten or anything. She looked just like she was alive. Oh, I get it. It's that thing. I don't remember the name. Where your body turns into some kind of wax. If a dead body is put in the right sort of environment, the fat in it turns into something kind of like candle wax, right? And... Yes, saponification. But that's not what it was. Huh? That's not it. She wasn't wax. Then what is it? They say that she was frozen. What? Frozen. That's right. The whole body was frozen solid. You know how a human body is more than 60% water? Well, all of that water was frozen. The story says that from the time of its discovery, all the way to when it got put on the Titanic. <sighs> really? What is... It's like the afternoon. What is wrong with me? I'm sorry, I'm not bored or anything. It's just my body's just like, you want to yawn right now while you're reading. <laughs> Even though it was carried through the desert, her body never melted. Jun and Junpei talked a little more and then went back to their investigation. But even as they did, his mind went back to what she told him. Ice that wouldn't melt, even in the desert. Could such a thing really exist? No. Even if it did, it wouldn't really be ice anymore, would it? The more he thought about it, the more his head hurt. Like he'd eaten his ice cream too fast. Alrighty then. Ooh, key! Okay, cool. This is the mirror for the dresser. And now she's playing with her hair. Does she even realize she's doing that? Hey, we don't have time for that. Come on, it's not like there's anyone here you need to impress. Yes, there is. Who? What? Why are you so quiet all of a sudden? <laughs> Forget it, Jumpy. Oh, Jumpy. Junpei, what are you doing? The chair that goes with the dresser, there's nothing particular interesting about it, okay? About this one? Ah, uh, Jumpy, what are you doing? We don't have time to be relaxing on the sofa. Fine. Jeez. Jumpy, where are you going? Um, I was thinking about going over to Lotus's room. Why? What do you mean, why? I was just gonna go check up on him. Is there something wrong with that? Well, no. Come back soon. Sure thing. I'll leave the rest to you. Sure. Leave it to me. Alright, off to the other room. Looks like a valuable vase. Empty though. There seems to be a room on the left side of the vase. 
There's a square, square tile in this frame. It's glued in there quite well. I don't think you could take it out. Okay, well that's curious. Oh my god. This is the bathroom wall. The whole wall is covered in these square tiles. It's a wall covered in small square tiles. They've all got geometric shapes on them. I guess we can't really do anything yet with that. Oh, uh, no, I wanted to click on the shower head. Whoa, look! Jinpei! There's a mushroom growing out of the wall! Um, that's a shower head. Really, Santa? This thing's a little shelf of putting soap on. I know. That's the shower knob. I tried turning it, but no water comes out. Okay. Is there anything in the toilet? Guess not. Tank's empty too. Some toilet paper. We've got two rolls, I guess. Okay, so I think we need to go back to the bed sheet. A candle with a candlestick. This might come in handy. Can we combine it with the matches? I know. If I use these matches to light the candle. Now what? Well, this is a display case. Check it out. These plates and everything look really expensive. You want to take a look? This tile. I think I've seen it somewhere. Yeah, I know. Kind of looks like the one we saw in the other room. So can we not take it? Is that what the key's for? Wrong key, huh? Oh, that means there's got to be another one somewhere around here. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to open this thing. Jinpei, I don't mean to pry, but you lit that candle so we could check that room over there, right? I mean, it's dark, you know? Uh, yeah, so? Well, you need to take it with you then. Otherwise, there's not really much point to lighting it. Oh, is that what it was for? Awesome. With the light from the candle, maybe we can take a look around over there. But, it gets so hot when I hold it. I want to put it down. Well, why don't you set it on top of the dresser? It's flat there. At least it won't fall over. Oh, yeah, good idea. Hey, it got pretty bright. Now we can look around over there. Um, is this locked? The dresser drawer is locked, okay? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> let's see if this, yes. Yes, it worked. Another piece, huh? Actually, Anything taped to the bottom of you, no? It's a light, man. Can't you figure that out on your own? Hard to tell if it burned out or not. Of course, now that we have the candle, I guess it doesn't really matter that much anymore. It's a chair for the dresser. I know that much, good lord. I'm not that dumb. It's a picture of an old cruise ship. Is it the Titanic? A bottle full of water. I don't think we're going to need this for anything. Okay, shower curtain. Anything under the blanket? Nope, nothing suspicious here. Okay. Two pillows in a pile. Oh. A pile of pillows. Is that supposed to be some kind of joke? Hey, hey calm down. Huh? Hey, what the hell? It just got dark all of a sudden. Maybe the candle got blown out. We should go see. There's a candlestick covered in melted wax on top of the dresser. Hey, what's this? The top of the candlestick looks kind of weird. You're right. It's all bumpy. Will that fit into the... Into here? Let's see if this candlestick key will do anything. Ha <laughs> ha Yes! It opened! Alright, pull that open! We need this. And I'm guessing... Hey Junpei, you got a minute? Santa showed up out of nowhere and gave Junpei no small start. Here, take this. Santa pulled something out of his pocket. It looked like a bookmark. It had a four-leaf clover on it. What is this? 
I found it in between some of the cushions on the sofa. Pretty sure it ain't gonna be uh, any help to us, but I figured we might as well hang on to it anyway. Then why don't you hold on to it? Santa gave him a wry smile. You know what I hate most in the world? I got four things. Hope, faith, love, and luck. Hope, faith, love, and luck. That's right. And do you hate these things? Yeah. You got a problem with that? Uh, not really, but... Junpei tried to figure out how to best phrase what he wanted to say. What does a bookmark have to do with any of that? Santa scratched the back of the ear and looked awkward. Well, see, each leaf on the four-leaf clover has a meaning to it, okay? And that meaning is pretty much those four words. It's like a flower language. Well, I guess it's not really a flower, is it? So, a leaf language, I guess? Yeah, you can call them leaf words. Leaf words? Junpei looked at the bookmark. Hope, faith, love, and luck. So yeah, I want you to take it, okay? Just touching it gives me the creeps. Take it, alright? Santa pretended to shiver with disgust and shoved the bookmark into Junpei's confused hands. Junpei, what do you want to do? Ah, let's take it. Sorry about that, guys. My controller fell and, like, unplugged itself and a bunch of pop-ups and stuff happened, so I had to take a second to get myself all recalibrated, but we are taking the bookmark from Santa. He's just being really weird about it. Oh, did I hit the wrong button? After all, why shouldn't he? Alright, sure. I'll take it. He shoved the thing into his pocket and gave Santa a last confused look. Phew! Man, I feel a lot better now. That thing was a real pain, you know? Do you really hate those four words that much? Yeah, well, they can all betray you, you know? Hope, faith, love, even your destiny. What had happened to Santa? Junpei wondered. How had he become such a bitter person? For a moment, they looked at each other. Well, that's not my only reason. What? That's not the only reason I hate the four-leaf clover. I just can't bring myself to like the number four. What? Worried about the four horsemen? Nah. Come on, man. That's just silly. Maybe back in the Dark Ages, that kind of crap scared people, but this is the 21st century, and I'm a 21st century guy. Then why do you hate four so much? It's it's a half-done number. Not the best or the worst. That's why. What? Nine is always the better number. So, what if it's last place, right? At least it's not some lame middle number. Santa's explanation made no sense. Junpei was even more confused than before. You play? Play? Gambling? You mean like, gambling? Uh, yeah, of course. What else would I mean? Stock market? In Baccarat, the best possible hand totals nine. They call it the Grande. But the lowest, most worthless cards, the zeros, they call monkey. Just like the guy in charge of this game, huh? Zero's a monkey. <laughs> Santa blinked, utterly stunned. Then, he began to laugh. <laughs> oh man, you're totally right! The guy who trapped us in here sure is one hell of a monkey. That was when Lotus spoke up. You know, if you think about it, the nonary game is a really a lot like Baccarat. Apparently, she'd been listening. Of course, it doesn't use any of that stupid digital root jump. You just drop the tenths digit and that's it. Still, it does have the same idea of your final number needing to be a single digit. Oh, yeah, I guess you have a point. And in both games, whoever has nine wins. The person who makes nine wins? Did you forget already? Don't you remember what Zero said? The exit is hidden, but it is there. Seek the exit. Seek the door that carries a nine. Which we did not find last time. So, if we want to get off this boat, we have to make a team whose numbers have the digital root of nine. And only the people in that team are going to make it out alive. Of course! That's why it's called the Nonary Game. What? Huh? You don't know? Nonary means something derived from nine or base nine. It's derived from the Latin prefix nona, which means nine. 
So, now we're learning about Lotus and her daughter's names, of course. Uh, while we're at it, the prefix for one is uni. You know, like unicorn, the horse with one horn. Two is bi, like binary. Binary means composed of two parts. Three is tri. I'm sure you've heard that one plenty. Like trio and triangle. You get the idea. After that, you have quart, quinty, sext, septum, and so on. And of course, the prefix for eight is octo, like octopus. It's called that because it has eight legs. Get it? I see. So then Nona means nine. Lotus nodded. So, how many of us are trapped on this ship? That'd be nine. And what are the bracelet numbers we have? They go from one to nine. And our time limit? How many hours do we have? Zero said nine hours. And finally, to get out of the ship. We need to find the door with the nine that's hidden somewhere on the ship. By making a team with the digital root of nine, Lotus nodded again. And there you have it. The number nine is everywhere in this game. He's got a real theme of nines for this whole thing. No wonder it's called the non in the game. Somewhere, far away, Junpei heard the creak of stressed metal. It sounded almost like Zero laughing at them, or the sad, desperate scream of a pig headed to the slaughterhouse. Well, that's comforting. Okay, so I think I know where the last... What's up? You gonna go back already? Well, I can't just leave June there by herself. <laughs> what do you think, you're neither her protector or something? Creeping me out. Whatever, man. I'm going. I think we need the shower curtain. Um... Oh, there's a bathroom in here, too. That's the bathroom wall. There's square tiles all over it. There sure are. The wall's covered with square tiles, okay. I don't think we need to do that, but... Uh, yeah. Why don't we go back to the living room? Okay, let's go back. Weird reason to have a conversation, but sure. Is this the... Here we go, the bed. A blanket. No? Do we take another look at this blanket? No, I think we've covered it pretty well. Looks like that one was lame enough to make her blush a little. Okay, um... Well, maybe I was wrong. I thought you'd have to put the shower curtain on top of the bed and that it would give you, like, a, uh, symbol or something to press. I guess not. The exit. Lotus is center in the room on the other side. I'm gonna check up on them. Okay, let's go... Here? Shower curtain? The wall covered in square tiles. If our... Yeah, I know. Curtain, huh? Well, it's got all these metal rings, so you could probably hang it from something, you know? Yes, but it doesn't look like a normal curtain. The way it feels, I think it's probably waterproof. Would you make the shower curtain? Oh, make it a shower curtain, yeah. I know oh. that! See, so you no know word it. Ah, here we go. There's a curtain rod running along the ceiling. Let's put that shower curtain on those hooks. Let's start spreading the curtains. Whoa, that's a pretty obvious people. Somebody's really dedicated. Well, with the hole this big, you gotta wonder if maybe they wanted to get caught. So you're saying maybe the one getting spied on was into that? Maybe they were into, like, those home invasion fantasies. Home invasion? Interesting. I see. You two are real idiots, you know that? Thanks. I wanna go on the other side, though. Yeah, here we go. Let's try spreading the curtains. There's a hole in the curtain, okay? If I look at it from a waist back, I can see a single tile. Alright, if, uh, from here when I can see the tile, it's... Fifth from the top and third from the right. Okay, I need to write that down, I think. Um... Fifth from the top and third from the right. Okay. Um, all right, looking at this hole, I can see a white tile. Let's have a closer look, shall we? Nothing strange here. Nope, the thing's not budging. Hmm. 
Well, that means we need to go to the other room. Now I can go to the other room. So I was right, I was just wrong. You know, if you miss her so much, you don't have to keep coming back here. Shh. <laughs> no, that's not what this is. I'm just being like a bridge between the two rooms. Uh-huh. You just keep telling yourself that. Now get out of here and go help June. Well then, why would I come and see you guys? Jeez. I think I'm just here for, for them. Okay, in the bathroom, Lois' room, I saw a particular towel when I looked at the hole in the shower curtain. Maybe if I look in the same place over here. Alright, no, where was it? It's on the top, third from the right. What are you mumbling about, Jumpy? Oh, sorry. Uh, could you be quiet for a minute? I don't want to forget this. She's like, what? One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. Here it is. Yes, this one's loose. I think I can get it, uh, get under this with my nails. And yes! There we go! Okay. So, now I've got, I believe, all of the panels here. There's a tile in the frame, so I guess I'm supposed to put the tiles in the empty spaces. Alright, I'm gonna give it a shot. Oh god, what do we make it? Oh, they can switch too. Oh, good lord. Well, apparently I did it. Yes, I did it. <laughs> there, picture complete. And there goes the frame. W what's this? What do you mean, what's this? Pretty obvious, isn't it? It's a hole in the wall. Like hidden safe or something, you know? Anyway, let's take a look. I think there's something inside. I'm just running into all sorts of issues today. My camera stopped working. I just, my life is just in shambles, but I want to get through this room. So Jim had messed around a bit with the key he had and looked blankly at the picture that slid down. What's the deal with this picture anyway? Santa had only been mumbling to himself, but it drew Lotus's attention. She looked at the picture and paused. I, I think I've seen this picture before. Where? In a book. There's a British biochemist named Sheldrake. He has a rather interesting theory. I saw this picture in his book. What's this interesting theory? Morphogenic field, which relies on the theory of morphic resonance. Man, I can't deal with this. Just listening to talk to you, listening to you talk about it's giving me a headache. Santa put his hands on his head as if he were in great pain. Lotus merely arched an eyebrow's direction and continued. It's not a difficult concept to grasp. In essence, he states that the shapes of living organisms and their behavioral patterns are transmitted through a, fi uh, a field not visible to the eye. Uh, what part of that isn't difficult, exactly? Lotus did not look pleased. Alright, how about this? Theory of the telepathic mechanism. Telepathy? Yes, telepathy. Well, perhaps not exactly telepathy, but... It's close enough for a simple approximation. Santa suddenly burst into laughter. <laughs> are you serious? Telepathy. Who do you think we are? Kids from the 70s? I can't believe somebody would actually do serious research on something like that. Yes, I agree. Lotus's response was surprisingly curt. Junpei had expected at least some conflict. I read the book, but I can hardly say I understood it. I'm in no position to defend or condemn anything it said. It was probably just someone latching on to st statistical outlier from uh, to a statistical outlier from some study and turning it into a ridiculous theory. There's no scientific merit to any of it, I'm sure. But even so, I. Anyway, I saw a picture like that, uh, like that one in this book. Lotus indicated the picture they'd all been looking at. After a moment, she walked up to the strange picture, examined it, and then spoke. Hey, what do you think this picture looks like? Santa answered first. What do you mean? Isn't it just like an abstract or something like that? It's just black and white scribbles. There's no meaning here. That's it. What about you, Junpei? Does it look like anything to you? Hmm. I guess it looks like... Oh god. Funyarpna? Um... 
I'm gonna go with the koi. Why not? Because I kind of see like a fish thing in the white in the middle over here. I don't know. It looks kind of fishy. A koi? See, there's the head and the tail. And there's the hands and the feet back there. Look, it's like a, looks like he's got some wings on the back, too. Junpei pointed to what he was talking about. After three seconds of silence, Lotus looked at Junpei. I really don't think that's how a koi looks. Junpei, are you just screwing around? Forget it. I'm just gonna tell you. This is a dog. Like, see? Like this. A dog? Lotus pointed out the parts of the picture, and eventually a dog took shape in them. It looked as though she had a point. Oh. Okay. It was a dog. Santa also nodded in agreement. So? Now we know what it's a picture of, but I don't see how that helps us. Lotus nodded and began to speak. A TV show from Great Britain did an experiment once. They took two similar pictures. Both of them were difficult to identify, initially. But once you figured out the answer, you couldn't see it as anything else. The first picture was a woman wearing a hat. The other one? Well, to make it easier. Let's just say it was this picture of a dog. So, their experiment. First, they sent the pictures to other parts of the world where British radio and television didn't reach. To Ireland, the US, Africa, Europe, etc. Then, in each country, they gathered a number of test subjects. All in all, there were roughly 1,000 people. Those 1,000 people were showed the two pictures and asked, what does this picture look like to you? The results, in and of themselves, were not very interesting. 9.2% of the people saw the lady in the lady picture. 3.9% saw the dog in the dog picture. Then, two days later, they broadcast a new show. During the 30 minute show, they broadcast the dog picture and its solution. The audience was estimated to be 200,000 people. After the broadcast, it could be assumed that the number of people who knew the solution to the dog picture now totaled over 200,000 people. After another two days had passed, they gathered a number of research subjects from areas where British TV and radio did not exist. This time, they were only able to find a sample of roughly 850 people. Naturally, none of them were people who had participated in the first test. They were, however, given the same test and the same two pictures. The results were shocking. 10% of the people who saw the lady, uh, people saw the lady in the lady picture. The previous test had yielded a 9.2 success rate. The change was not that statistically significant. The dog picture, however, produced a very different result. The percentage of people able, able to successfully find the dog grew from 3.9% to 6.8%, a very significant increase. So, do you understand? Do you realize the significance of this experiment? There was no way the second group could have seen the picture. They lived far away from Britain and couldn't have seen the picture. But even so, it was the only success rate for the dog picture that went up. Why? How did that happen? What does it mean? Lotus looked back and forth from Junpei to Santa and back again. Normally, calm and collected, she looked now as though she were very nearly possessed and there was something manic about her manner. Santa took an involuntary step backwards. Junpei didn't budge and stared straight back into Lotus's eyes. Does this have something to do with that field or whatever it was you were talking about earlier? A field not visible to the eye? So if more people know the answer, then that information will pass through the field. Psych! Her manner suddenly shifted, and Lotus smiled broadly at Junpei and Santa. She waved her hand dismissively, doing her best to laugh the whole confrontation off. Oh, I was just kidding. You really shouldn't take me seriously. Well, I mean the things I just told you are about, uh, about are true. They really did happen. But the results of that experiment really aren't anything to go by. They could have easily falsified them. In the end, I'm sure they were just in it for the ratings. They are a TV station, after all. At last, it seems Santa had gained control of his composure. R right! Man, I gotta admit, you had me there for a minute. I uh, really thought you were serious. <laughs> I 
Of course not. Like I told you before, I'm sure it was all just pseudoscience. Uh, oh, okay, right. <laughs> Santa and Lotus laughed and gave one, uh, uh, gave one another jovial claps on the shoulder. Junpei, however, didn't feel so much like laughing. Something felt wrong, unclear. All right, enough nonsense. We've got the key. Let's get out of here. Word. <laughs> Lotus and Santa walked away from the picture, but Junpei stayed, staring at the picture of the dog. A field not visible to the naked eye. Morphogenic field. The more he thought about it, the more his head hurt. So. Alright. Let's go to the hallway. I'll go get June. You guys head to the door. Okay. Roger that. You guys see how uh, that story kind of coincides with the uh, story that Seven was saying? About the molecules and how they were learning to crystallize? Yes, it unlocked. Good job, Jinpei. Good, now we can get going. Come on, what are you guys standing around for? Let's get out of here. Come on, Jumpy, let's go. All right, let's go. We did it, we escaped. All righty. You know what I might do, um, even though this episode is gonna be a little bit shorter, since I've been running into issues and apparently I need to take like a break and wake myself up a little bit. I might go ahead and the, end the episode here very soon so that we can start the next episode. There's actually um, two more areas that we need to go to in order to get to not a bad end, but a branching path. And then I have to restart it and go back through and get the other two bad endings. So we got a little bit of stuff we need to do, but I need to figure out what's going on with my camcorder and find out why it keeps messing up. They step through the door to find themselves in a wide hallway. Junpei, June, Lotus, and Santa stopped for a moment and looked at their surroundings. A short distance away, a metal grate extended across the width of the hallway. It took hold and shook, but it refused to move. Nearby was a pair of elevators. It took only a few button presses to determine that the elevators would not respond to their efforts. They could only assume the elevators were not powered. There was only one door left. Well, looks like we don't have any choice. Yeah. Sure does. Well then, let's open it. Junpei grabbed hold of the knob and quietly pushed open the door. He entered, slowly, trying to take in as much of his surroundings as he could. The others followed shortly. Oh, so it's a kitchen. Santa did not look pleased. What? What were you expecting? Isn't it obvious? The exit. I was hoping this would be the way out of here. <laughs> you really think it'd be that easy? Yeah, yeah, I know. Still. As they talked, Lotus headed deeper into the room. Until at last, she stood in front of a door. If we can just get through this door, we should come out on the other side of that grate we saw earlier. But don't we need a key for that? Sorry. Guess that wasn't very constructive. Neither Junpei nor Lotus looked terribly happy. Junpei dug the ship mat from his pocket and spread it out in front of him. As he did... Hey! What's that? Huh? Oh yeah, I, I guess I forgot to tell you. I found this a little while ago. It's a map of the B deck. Before Junpei could finish, Lotus snatched the map away from him. She ran her finger across it, muttering to herself. I knew it. See? Look. Junpei did as he was told. Santa and June moved over to look at the map as well. See? We came in here, and if we go out there, then we'll end up on the other side of the grate. With their finger, Lotus traced the path on the map. She was right. Satisfied that she had been correct, Lotus folded the map and handed it back to Junpei. He took it and slid the valuable piece of paper back into his pocket. There's a card reader on the right side of the door. Then that means the key card is somewhere in here, right? That seems most likely. Alright, we know what we need to do then. Let's get moving. First off, I say we split up and look for clues. Okay. So, in the next episode, we will leave the kitchen, and then we will be able to proceed onward and find out exactly what else is going on on this ship. It's actually pretty cool. I actually like it, and 
I think I'm actually playing through it the same way that I did when I initially purchased the game for myself years and years and years ago. Like, I think I went through with uh, Seven and Snake the first time around and then went through the kitchen the second time. So hopefully I won't suck too much on these puzzles, but I am very sorry that uh, I'm having some technical difficulties. At least we made it through the episode. I'm going to slap myself awake and find out what's going on. But thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know if you enjoyed. I'll see you guys on the next MAMJ. Okay. One dead body lay behind door number five. The body of the night. Another lay in the shower. The body of Snake. At the central staircase were three more. Ace, Santa, and Chloe. Just outside the door were two corpses. Those of Seven and Lois. And in this very room lay the body that had once been king. And now, Junpei would join them.